Thank you very much for the invitation and the chance to speak of something which has been my interest for many years. Um, so I will start off by making some uh, historical notes on, on cerebral blood flow because I think um, it was actually here in Copenhagen this uh, data came out. Um, this was by Hans Lau and that was in the late 70s. And I think that was one of, one of the papers who sort of changed concepts. I mean, the idea here is that uh, the autoregulation, which is a mechanism which sort of stabilizes the blood flow to the brain uh, when the blood pressure changes, uh, that autoregulation was demonstrated some 10, 15 years earlier, actually also in this city. But uh, Hans Lau's observation here was that in this group of, you would say, small group of patients, um, here the systolic blood pressure, because at that time the way you measured blood pressure when you didn't have it invasively, that was by a um, Doppler method, that was a cuff and a Doppler, uh, which is a very good method of measuring, determining the systolic blood pressure. And then he measured the cerebral blood flow actually by xenon clearance by an interarterial technique. So the, what he did was when they placed the umbilical artery catheter, they advanced it to the arch of the aorta, sometimes probably to enter it into the carotis, and he injected xenon there. And then there is a mono exponential clearance, and that is the flow. I mean, that's a very robust method. So these data are of you can say of high quality and they were published prestigiously and really set a scene that these tiny babies are unable to control their blood flow to the brain so they are vulnerable so we have to be very careful about circulation. Well xenon uh, is a radioactive isotope, it's a noble gas, it emits a gamma radiation and, and that gamma radiation has a half layer of about uh, five centimeters so when you put a detector to the surface of the brain um, here, no I haven't I started this, uh, I should probably press here. <coughs> I forgot my specs. Yes, can you sit in the point of view? Yeah, so the detector here, which is sort of collimated, so you, so you detect here with high sensitivity from the cortex just here. But since the volumes at a distance are larger, it means actually that 40% of counts, so 40% of the signal come from the contralateral hemisphere, and that's why it is actually a measure of global cerebral blood flow, white and gray matter and central ganglia. So... Um, I was involved in 1982 uh, because I also have a degree in computer science and, uh, when, and, and this was developed in the US and here so you could give xenon intravenously uh, and then you could still get, still get a measure of cerebral blood flow and that obviously made that method much more amenable, you could do that repeatedly. It's clear that radioactive acetone gives a radiation, it corresponds to roughly to two to three chest X of the chest x of the ch chest x rays so it is a radiation but it is certainly not an excessive radiation for so for a good purpose our research ethics committee thought that that was permissible um, so you have the detector over the head and a detector over the chest and the idea here is that then you have the xenon is a gas it goes to the lungs it most is actually exhaled but that would enter the the systemic circulation is sort of loaded to the brain by blood flow and cleared from the brain by blood flow. And the, the calculations here based on the FIC principle. So all this is pretty robust uh, physics and uh, physiology. So the numbers you get out of this are sort of gold standard. So one of my first results here was that um, cerebral blood flow is actually pretty low. I mean human adult flow, and again this is robust because of the same methods, it's in the range of 45 milliliters per 100 grams per minute, and these preterm infants during the first day of life, uh, the first few days of life, were in the range of 20 to 15, 10. And that came as a great surprise. By, by that time most people thought that brain, blood flow to the brain was greater than, higher than in adults in, in, in the immature brain because of the high metabolism, you imagine all the cells, eager cells working and dividing and so on, because it is in, in lamp and in piglets. 
and that was just extrapolated to the human condition. But I mean, it's not strange because a newborn human infant is certainly a very different animal <laughs> than a, a newborn lamb, which is st standing to its feet and already moving around, so much more mature. And the brain is also um, obviously anatomically more ma mature. But this finding really wasn't accepted until it was repeated by PET. And PET is certainly not a better technique. On the contrary, it depends on quite a long, because it is very tiny, but obviously PET, PET is a big machine, so that was, um, now I think it's generally accepted. The second finding was that there is something about the intensity of treatment, so here with babies with no ventilatory support, and here baby on, the, on a rapid mechanical ventilation, there is a linear relation, so these flows are really to the lower side. So suggesting that those babies who are under intensive care with a, with a high dependence on ventilation are in particular, well, perhaps at particular risk of, of um, hypoxia, cerebral hypoxia, I mean ischemia, too little brain flow to the brain. And therefore these results may be of interest. Uh, here we linked again, because we could do that repeatedly, uh, here we linked, these are different babies though, um, we um, linked it to EEG activity. Uh, here, the discontinuous activity, most babies are in this band, these are preterm infants, and, and there's a good uh, large range. I should say that we, it, because of the nature of the measure, measurement, we had quite good concepts of the precision. It was ranging about plus minus 15%, that would be the precision. So this, this point certainly not certainly here, it would be somewhere between here and here. Um, so this was discontinuous activity, this was continuous activity, these were the few babies who actually had seizures, these were those who were birth suppression, and these had a flat trace. So what you see out of here is that you actually can have, and most babies do have, blood flows more than five, and they do have electrical activity. So, so because this is also a, a very basic concept of neurons, I mean, if you, if you deprive them of oxygen, the first thing they will do is to faint. They will stop having electrical activity and, and the, the person will faint. Uh, so without, before sort of damage happens. So, so the EEG here is some kind reflecting this fainting point. So I could also uh, re-examine the question about the relation between blood flow and, uh, and uh, blood pressure. And here it's much less clear picture. These are repeated measurements. Each line is a baby who's studied twice. And you can see many of them had changes in blood pressure uh, and also changes in blood flow. But there's certainly no clear picture that, it, that flow increases with, with pressure, perhaps except for this baby, which happened also to have a high PCO2, uh, a, a large change in PCO2, and, and perhaps this baby who happened to have a very low flow. But, but overall, there's certainly no clear relation. And very differently, the PCO2s had a strong relation among infants as well as within infants. So that may, drives a very clear conclusion that PCO2 is a much more important variable for the, determining the blood flow to the brain than the blood pressure. And it happened at that time in, also in Copenhagen that we were running until we had, as I think was conventional at that time, uh, almost routinely intubated preterm infants. If they showed sign of respiratory distress at, at the delivery, they were almost routinely intubated and ventilated. And then by that time, we only had pressure-limited ventilators and, and doctors were busy, so sometimes babies were intubated and then they were... Uh, the ventilator was set and then uh, the doctor was busy with something else so it took time before you got your blood sample and sometimes the blood sample tended to be very low. So I was able to see the outcome of a number of babies who were accidentally hyperventilated to PCO2s of less than 2 kilopascals with the first arterial blood gas. This corresponds to 15 millimeters of mercury. So this is clearly bad practice, but I mean, it happened not due to, not to, to ill will, but due to busyness and perhaps incompetence. Uh, and you can see three of those had cerebral palsy, whereas none of those who were normal ventilated or who were not intubated at all had cerebral palsy. 
Um, so that was the first evidence that this very low CO2 actually risks to damage the brain. That has been repeated in different ways many times across the world and to my mind there's no doubt that, that hyperventilation, accidental inadvertent hyperventilation is one of the iatrogenic epidemics that we as neonatologists along with too much oxygen and too much too much um, tetracycline and <laughs> too much sulfonamide and too much steroid we have inflicted on our patients. So that rises up the question how can what can we do to come in before damage happens and, and we have this line of our events, inadvertent hyperventilation, hypocapnia, reduced cerebral blood flow, and so on, then brain hypoxia ischemia, if it gets too much, and if too much ischemia, you get brain injury, and too much brain injury, they get psychomotor deficit, cerebral palsy. Um, and obviously, we have better ventilators now, volume control, we, some uses transcutaneous PCO2, but the problem with this is that even the same minute volume doesn't give the same PCO2 in all babies and the same PCO2 does not give the same blood flow in all babies and the same blood flow does not give the same oxygenation so it's a line of, of line of thread and the, you can say there are also other factors influencing obviously I spoke of blood pressure there's a long history about low cardiac output um, Unfortunately, the brain is not a privileged organ. We, we think of the brain being sort of the last perfused organ, but it is not. The brainstem is, the heart is, the, the adrenals is, but the telencephalon, the, the hemispheres, who cares? I mean, the young baby doesn't consider that an, an important asset. So flow goes down when, the, when circulation is compromised. And then even for when it comes to, I mean, one thing is flow, but another thing is what blood is going to the brain, that depends on the saturation and also on hemoglobin. So all these factors influence actually the risk or the degree of brain hypoxia ischemia. And the idea is you could sort of detect that if you sort of looked at the oxygenation of the brain. And we actually did, we worked with near infrared spectroscopy to assess brain oxygenation for many years. I, I got engaged in the mid 80s. And, um, and here is a tracing, it was Ole Prutz uh, who took over my job as a research fellow at, at Rijks Hospital here. Here is a tracing of a baby who's monitored by near infrared spectroscopy. And you see here is a zero, so it's a random zero. This is continuous wave, simple continuous wave near infrared spectroscopy. And, and this is very stable, and then the ventilator is set here, allowed PCO2 to rise. And up here, hemesia also uh, was seen on, cerebral blood flow was seen on, and you see that low, low number, and then when, when the ventilator is set, transcutaneous CO2 increases, blood flow increases as measured by xenon, and the amount of blood in the brain here, total hemoglobin, increases a bit because of the vasodilation, so there's more blood in the brain, and there is particularly much more oxygenated and less deoxygenated, so the brain gets sort of pinker. And then he reset the ventilator once more to decrease ventilation, PCO2 increased even more, more blood to the brain, blood flow increased, and the brain became even more pink. So this is just illustrating that this is a very strong mechanism. And then uh, some 15 years ago, uh, technology developed. So now using again the infrared spectroscopy, depending on the, the different spectra of, um, of the two oxygen species, oxyhemoglobin here increases its absorption with wavelength, whereas deoxyhemoglobin has this peak at 670 and then decreases. That allows you within this wave, range of wavelengths to determine sort of the relation between oxygen and deoxyhemoglobin. And when you put down, this is very different from pulse oximetry, which is sort of looking at a pulsating signal. This is looking at, the, at all the hemoglobin. So when you put down photons here in the source, photons will go into the tissue, will spread around at random. Those getting too close to the surface will get lost, and therefore there is no signal from that superficial layer here. In the photons who are detected here at this stage, they will statistically, typically have been to some depth and then recover it here. Those going straight too far into tissue will never find back. So that is the reason why we have this sort of banana shape uh, 
in area of interest which is sitting between the source of light and the sensor and the sensor detector of light. And since blood is in the vascular bed, that you can have blood outside, obviously you have a hemorrhage, but you don't have a hemorrhage, blood is in the vascular bed, and most of the vascular bed is veins. You can see the thin arteries and the heavy veins. So three quarter, two third to three quarters in vein, and that means that we have a venous weighted measure. And by detecting light at some differences, distances here, you get an absolute measure in a range zero to 100, just like a pulse oximeter. So that is pretty simple in concept to use for a clinician, except for remembering this is not a pulse oximeter, this is a tissue oximeter, it is not venous, but it's venous weighted measure. So we formed a consortium some now, it's some nearly 10 years ago, uh, with colleagues from all these European cities, uh, in order to examine the potential clinical benefits and harms of cerebral oximetry. And we did that because we said we don't want to disturb babies unless it's necessary. I mean, we already interfere so much with them. I mean, they are, um, and we now know, I mean, that time perhaps we knew less, but now know it's so important to allow the parents access and we now want to have skin to skin and the more lines and monitors and so on, the more complicated, the more difficult that part of it, that aspect of care is. And um, this is a tracing from Petra Lemmer's thesis in Utrecht. In Utrecht, they worked with this method for many years and have done, used it routinely. And uh, this is a baby at 24 weeks gestation. And here you have the uh, uh, cerebral oxygenation, which starts sort of 70 and dropping down to 55, increasing briefly. This is an hour's trace and then dropping again and then increasing and dropping. So it, illustrating how important it is to monitor I mean, it doesn't make much sense to make one measurement and then, then you are done. Um, and then in this particular baby, this is a blood pressure trace. So it's here quite clear that in this particular baby, blood pressure seemed to be very important. And, and this response suggests that this was a volume bolus. It is a kind of response you expect to find on a volume bolus, a transient effect on blood pressure. And uh, for the purpose of our trial, we defined the burden of hypoxia the cerebral hypoxia as the area under the curve here under 55 using that particular system. Um, and our question then was, can we reduce that burden if we use and monitor cerebral oxygenation? Um, and in order to help those who took care of baby, because this is happening 24 seven, obviously, this is not a, a PhD project where you have asked a PhD student to do something carefully. This is part of clinical care. Uh, so we, we devised this list of suggested uh, interventions, things you could consider. I spoke of the CO2, um, but also blood pressure, obviously, inotropes, we had the case here, uh, transfusion, airway pressures, too much pressure, impairing, impairing the, the return to the heart. Uh, perhaps you could increase FiO2 if you are in the low range, or you could close a duct. And we also in this study, in this trial, had the issue, what about the oxygenation is too high? I will not say so much about that. So we did a randomized trial, where we had the cerebral oximetry with a visible screen, and uh, obviously uh, lots of other things going on with these infants, so st uh, um, standard care. And that was against cerebral oximetry, which we recorded because we needed it for comparison, but the monitor was hidden in a wooden box, and the only thing came out was a, to align to a PC who reported to the clinician that the monitor was recording, and, and, but you just saw that the signal was okay. And the primary outcome here was accumulated burden of hypoxia and hypoxia. So the question was, can we use this signal to keep the cerebral oxygenation within same safe, a safe re reason, a, a safe uh, range? And, and we could. I, I say we could. That was eight neonatal units in Europe, and there must have been 50 or 100 clinicians, nurses, and, and, and doctors involved in it. And you see about eight in each group. The reason why the numbers are not equal is because uh, we were stratifying for NICO. 
Uh, and so in the group with the open ears, uh, there was certainly still a burden. We cannot always solve that problem. Some of these hearts, some of these vessels, some of these babies are just too sick. But it was at least much less than in the uh, hidden. And that was very statistically significant and now that was now published quite some years ago. So the next question is, well, we can do it, but does that help babies? So this is what we are doing now. We do want to do a trial with a patient-relevant outcome. And, and these are the numbers from the, from the Safe Push 2 trial. We had 35% death or severe brain injury at 36 weeks in the control group. And we had 26% in the intervention group. And we say if you can repeat that, that would require 800 plus 800 babies. And that means that if you want a NICU, want to, and I say a NICU because this is obviously babies admitted to a NICU, so this is not a question of single investigators, it's a question of having a team who wants to back up. Uh, so first thing is to want to, can you remain in equipoise until the end of the trial, or will you feel compelled when you're seeing a patient or a baby or you know the parents to say, I have to do the best, so I need to do it. Um, uh, we obviously need ethical approval and organized GCP monitoring. This is going to be a large trial with many units, so we need some external check that the babies are there, that consents are there, and that the primary outcomes have been properly recorded. We will have a blinded reading of, of routine ultrasounds. And then um, we need some training. And we need, we said here from the start, we need to start randomizing April 2019, and I can say that's not going to happen. Uh, and then uh, we need to have, people need to have a certain volume because uh, return on investment. I mean, we don't want to have units who contribute one or two patients, both for uh, economical but also for statistical reasons. And then we will use um, uh, these oximeters which are available on the market and uh, those who are, are approved for clinical use. So it won't be a device trial. It is not a trial of a device. It's a trial of a way of treating patients. So it's comparing two different ways or two way different policies of treating, treating babies. Uh, and that requires that we know how these are done working. And the problem is they don't work all the same. Uh, this is um, an experiment in a blood lipid phantom where we mimic the optical characteristics of the preterm brain and skull and scalp and, and then adding hemoglobin and, and the yeast will digest the hemolysis, the oxygen so the saturation will drop in the solution to zero actually then we'll add some more hemoglobin and then uh, reoxygenate with bubbling oxygen and then dropping down again and more hemoglobin and this way we examine various combination of of optical properties and then the effect of deceleration. And using a reference method here, we can see that these available clinically approved instruments actually give quite different numbers. But we can then do a calibration. And we have this table of calibration. Um, and this is the present organization. So we have 200, 120 seven NICUs who have expressed interest in, in taking part in, in 20 countries. Um, so the current challenges, are, I'll take them from the bottom, uh, economics. We have applied for money many times <laughs> and ended up being able to finance the clinical trial center and a PhD student here who is pretty busy uh, but I cannot cover any cost in NICUs and that is obviously a problem. Uh, we have problems now with contracts. Uh, you may, those of you who do trial know that people are getting, uh, the lawyers getting increasingly careful about who's responsible for what. And, and there's little value here. I mean, there's no IP intellectual property right, but still, I mean, these contracts have to be signed. We have um, now quite some problems with GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations in Europe, who are very strict on who actually controls data and who checks that those who handle the data do what they have to do. And we have here in this, and we are the coordinating investigator, we have our data protection office 
is very, very keen not to do anything wrong, and that obviously gives a cautiousness list, which is uh, taking time. Um, and then we have an issue about informed consent, because you, in this context you can um, have um, the standard prior informed consent. We want to start as soon as the baby arrives in the NICU, at the latest at six hours to allow for babies being born outside. Um, and in this situation, you all know, I mean, you can speak to parents and they do understand something. And sometimes the mother is awake from the anesthesia and the, sometimes the father is not there. There are lots of complexities. And if you want to explain this in proper, um, you can certainly get consent, but that consent is not always so full. You also a method of deferred consent where you realize that this is an op uh, that this is too difficult. So you rather start on your own responsibility, and then you check with the parents when you have a chance or they have a chance to have a proper conversation. And there's also, as in particular, a UK option about opting out, where you present probably more or less that you do for clinical uh, consent. You say your baby is very small; he's not breathing well. I intend to intubate him and give him a fact, and is that okay? Or perhaps you even say, is that okay? You say, this is my intention. And if the parents say, fine, then that is a consent. So these are different ways of doing this. And, um, and um, we are sort of decided to allow all of them, provided that the local ethics committee would agree. Yeah. Francesco, could we have these questions? Yeah. Thank you so much. That is very important for me because we decided here in Denmark, because this, is, this, is, this ethics process is happening now in parallel in many countries, uh, so we decided here to apply for deferred consent. Uh, because in the Safe Bush uh, 2 trial, we had two PhD students here who were sort of actually taking the consent and they were sort of sh changing, and I did some also. Uh, this is obviously a very different trial in the sense that this is a pragmatic, low-cost trial. We had very different resources. Uh, so this is going to happen at the clinical stage. Um, I'm also, uh, I mean, from other sides, I'm a little bit concerned about the, the, F, the influence, I mean, the importance put to uh, consent. I know this is a, a political... Uh, you can say it's a political, I mean, uh, there's no question that the Helsinki Declaration is stating that very clearly. Um, but the quality, the quality of the consent, the quality of information and quality of consent is probably uh, somehow exaggerated. 
and be exposed to that big time when we use the web these days and we are every now and then there's something popping up do you agree to and I mean what is the quality of that consent you actually give consent to something which you because you don't have time you don't want to spend the time so so I think there's issue so we decided to apply for that and we plan to have a be allowed to go and have a be presenting our case to the research ethics committee and then they will make the decision because that's how it is yeah okay i'll just say a few words about the future of nias in neonatology also um, i take part in something which maybe some of you also have tried there's a, a there's a international standardization organization and i mean this is a they are take they're doing lots of interesting thing making sure that plugs are fitting if you need to travel to different countries very practical uh, big thing um it is um it's uh, every country is a member and, and usually for most countries they, there's a local national standardization organization and you can become a member here. In this country you can be a member for free if you're employed in the national health care. But if you are in industry you will pay a fee and the Danish standards is actually a non-profit private organization which is then representing Denmark in this. And I entered because um, I was pushing for getting a standardization of several nearest oximeters because I think it is a nuisance that these meters actually is impossible for the user to really to know these numbers and we have, the industry has been very little interested in sort of displaying these differences in measuring uh, and I think it's precisely like, like electrical plugs it would just be easier for the user if it was standardized um, very interesting process probably the first standard will come out in about a year it has taken already one and a half year and industry is there and, and academics are there and in very different opinions and in the end countries will vote on a standard that's how that goes this is a little bit of research we did uh, and unfortunately I haven't published yet but I'll show you it is a baby not strange, very preterm, one day in a unit, having spontaneous deceleration, the black line is, is arterial deceleration due to apnea. I mean, we all have those babies. A deep deceleration here due to apnea recovers some smaller decelerations. And here, two different cerebral oximeters sitting on both sides of the head. And you, we have chosen this curve because the baseline is very different, so they are clearly seen differently. They're not always so different. Uh, and you see they respond to the deceleration that they should and recovers here with the hypoxia, post insult hypoxia here. Uh, so quite in parallel, but you can already see here uh, probably a little bit of different sensitivity. And we did that in 10 babies where we had four hours with the sensors like this and then four hours with the sensors like this. So we had 20 observations. And here you have these 20 regression lines with a common regression line. The, the red line is a line of identity and the blue and the green are some different ways of doing the statistics and the thin lines are the individual regression lines. So it's quite clear that these two instruments are different. We knew that already. Uh, so they're differently sensitive to hypoxia. It, but now it's not in a blood lipid phantom. It's actually in a preterm newborn brain. So this is uh, real stuff. And you can see here that, that the regression lines actually fit pretty well with the blood lipid phantom. So, so that average problem is probably well described in, a, in, in vitro and in vivo. But the most important thing is here, and that is that although this is a common estimate, there are some dramatic outliers where it was just different. And that's a little bit. Know that there is different. If you sort of move the sensor, you get different values, and sometimes you happen to get a very different value. Okay, this is a baseline problem, but the fact that they react differently to hypoxia is another question. And I think there's no, it's most likely is because the, 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 op, the head is really not the brain only there. We have some pockets of CSF and, 
and, and you put your sensor here, sometimes you have a lot of these clear layers so that photons will travel not in a homogeneous way but in an inhomogeneous way. So this is a, a, an issue which we might address by getting more um, spread sensors, um, might address by other ways. So this is a problem. So it's never going to be a sort of an exact, I don't think. Better technology. Um, I was involved in, a, in a, an attempt to develop a better instrument where combining a way of measuring cerebral oxygenation with measuring cerebral blood flow. Um, this was European money and the idea was to sort of prepare for an indus industrial production. Uh, so in one response, I won't say so much, but he's using a different way to measuring, um, uh, measuring oxygenation by uh, time resolved spectroscopy. <laughs> and in this, in this technology, you give a very short pulse of light, and this is uh, in picoseconds. And then, um, but I mean, this is common day now. You can, in a, in a market, if some of you are doing some repair works at home, you can buy in a, in a shop, you can buy a pointer which will measure the distance to that wall within a precision of a millimeter, actually using the same sort of method. It just gives a very brief point, pulse of light, hits the wall, get back, and measures the time. So it's a time of flight measurement. It's somehow incredible that you can, and, and this is the same thing, short parts of light, and then here the light comes back just at, not at one buck, but sort of in a spread it out pattern, and that's because the light which you've injected into the tissue is sort of traveling around, and some goes back, directly back, and other, other photons have gone further astray and takes longer time to get back. And that allows you to look at those who come back late, because they have been far away and that means they're being deep into tissue. So that gives you simply a different way. And um, uh, so that is again the reason why you get, you were able to de detect in a distance. And that gives you in, for physical reasons, a much better assessment of the absorption coefficients and thereby a more better definition of the hemoglobin spectrum and therefore better saturation measurement. But uh, the other aspect the other aspect of this uh, um, machine or this uh, hybrid instrument with two that was a blood flow measurement and here the principle is different you send in uh, a light which has a high degree of coherence i mean uh, light is waves and when all the photons are waving in in synchrony light is coherent but then when the light is sort of reflected back then it loses the coherence because some light will come back from a longer distance and in particular if light is hitting a moving scatterer there will be a slight Doppler effect so the frequency will be shifted a little bit and then they will lose the coherence faster and that is the so coherence spectroscopy and this is uh, an in vitro example just to show you the principle that the the lines here is in uh, in an in vitro where the where the, there is a small capillary tubes with blood flowing through and when the blood flows fast the coherence is 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 decreasing faster just to illustrate that this actually works in in reality and here you see that in a vitro system this you can get a very very precise determination of flow within your capillary tubes so we used that in that instrument on piglets where we measured uh, blood flow with uh, positron emission tomography PET, which is a sort of a gold standard reference, and then with this blood flow index, and each color is a piglet, and you see this pretty good. And this is much better than the xenon, which we sort of uh, separate injections that you record over some time, because this is almost instantaneous measurement, so that is actually allows a monitoring of blood flow. And that would be very useful um, the problem is that the whole machine still is pretty heavy and it's going to be expensive also and, and you can't imagine such an instrument at each bedside uh, um, and each cut. Uh, so probably the most likely development of that instrument would be into some kind of a probe where you could sort of move like an ultrasound machine and then you could get a measurement of brain oxygenation and blood flow uh, at an, any time you wanted. Um, yeah.